Hello, my name is Avery Kaplan. I'm the comm officer at Prism Comics. And today I am super excited to be able to speak with a cow about Magical Boy, the Prism Comic Award winning webcomic and now graphic novel from Scholastic Graphics. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm so excited to talk about it. <laughs> awesome. So I'm just going to dive right in with my first question. Um, what were the origins of Magical Boy? Can you tell us about the journey from webcomic to graphic novel? Oh, man. Okay. So it all started, you know, with the opportunity with Tapas. Um, they were calling for artists for their incubator program for like funding 10 artists to make their own stories. And so that was really the pushing point of me like, okay, if I get it, I get it. That's when I start this story. If I don't, then I'll continue what I've been doing, doing free comics online on their platform anyways. Um, if For those who don't know, Tapas is the online free comic platform. <laughs> And so like when I submitted my idea, it was just a two sentence idea of like, yes, a trans man who becomes a magical girl and he has to fight against that and become who he is. And then they're like, yes, we like it. Let's do this. And I'm like, oh, oh snap. I, ha I actually have to create the story now. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like prior to that, I was just like, I've always been thinking like, I'll wait till the right story comes to me and then I'll make this the comic. And then this was a great way for me to force to actually sit down, make the comic, think about it, um, or also be distracted. And so that's when I started creating this, um, the story for Tapas. And then it just went on from there. <laughs> and I, I actually asked uh, Tapas to keep it free while I'm working on it. Um, because I thought it was very important as it's uploading like every two weeks or the during the schedule that people see that I have good intentions for this character because if people don't see like right away I feel like they might there was people who were like scared of like what are you trying to do with this trans boy why are you forcing him to wear a skirt and transforming into a magical girl oh my god you know so like I was afraid of that happening like no wait <laughs> read this for free so you can see that I have good intentions for this it's gonna be really rough but I promise it's gonna pay off um but once I finished the series, it was finally locked like it was supposed to because it's a premium comic. And with the help of Tapas, Tapas was the one that helped like push it to publishers and see who would like want to pick it up as a physical book. And from there, like I knew if the publishers didn't want to transform into a physical book, I was so ready to go crowdfunding route. Like <laughs> this, the, the, the web comic is made if it if no one's going to pick it up, I'm willing to, you know, organize to get it crowdfunded to become a physical book. So I'm like blown away that Scholastic picked it up and then therefore it became a graphic novel. And now it's in bookstores everywhere in the U.S. and I'm so excited. So yeah, it's been a journey. <laughs> okay, so my next question is about a specific character. Um, obviously, Walnut was inspired by certain cats from genre stories, but I'm curious if there were any real life animal inspirations for the character as well. For like any of the characters or the cat or? For the, well, for the cat specifically is what I'm most interested in. Oh. Any of the characters for sure. Oh yeah, so like the cat, someone did ask from a previous interview at, um, if it was inspired by my current uh, adopted cat who I named Moo Moo. Um, which is sadly no, because I adopted him afterwards for like, after I made a good chunk of Magic Boy, that's when I adopted uh, my cat. Um, I could say part of it was from our previous cat that sadly passed away, uh, Winter, that was just my boyfriend's um, cat. Uh, but I just in general love cats and pets in general. And I like chunky cats. <laughs> and so it was just based on like my love for them and being sarcastic and a, a little bit different from like what you see in Magical Girl tropes and genre where like they're hyper and high pitch and very squeaky and cute like I wanted him to be sophisticated snarky and I imagined him a very low voice <laughs> which if it was ever a tv adaptation or like um, an animation I, I want to hear that <laughs> you know like that's the image I had for Walnut the cat awesome. um, yeah and then for like other characters yeah there's bits and pieces of the personality are based from friends I know from real life bits and pieces for my personality or my alter ego of wanting to be more assertive and action, you know, packed, <laughs> like being more confident, like wishing for those things that like I could have my characters be that, you know, um, specifically I could 
make an example of um, Jen, Max's best friend, which is a great example of my one of my best friends who was very supportive when you know I was coming out um, as pansexual and everything like that. Like she was there for me, and then like I also have other friends in the community, and so they were also supportive. And just like knowing I have friends like that, I wanted Max to have friends similar to that as well. That's awesome. Okay, so can you tell us a little bit about designing Max's costume? As a trans story, was it important to you to include clothing as part of his character arc? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the whole um, idea around Magical Boy um, was the fact of the, the transformation scenes in Magical Girl genres. And like the whole thing about like being transformed into a dress. Like for trans men, that's like the worst thing they want to happen when they're first coming out and transitioning. They want to get away as, as far as possible. And so like showing how it gradually becomes more masculine is showing that he's able to do it and that it's okay. And that like, he's coming true to himself. Like it was a representation, visual representation that I was able to show through comics using the visuals of like this costume transformation, transforming with him. Um, designing it like was I you know we use references from Sailor Moon and other magic I literally googled mag magical girl outfits <laughs> and then try to like pick and choose aspects from it um, people are also wondering like why did you choose this weird color scheme it was, just came from you know like how I drew galaxies and that was like the whole theme of like the deities that I wanted to go with and so I stayed with the purples and the blues and everything and people noticed that some of the um highlights like the ribbons and stuff were trans colors <laughs> and so like I was like putting that in there <laughs> like if you notice it you notice it you know <laughs> trying to put those key elements in there as well so that was fun um but his outfit was uh originated from like also combining the 90s and 80s style like with the holographic stuff because I was putting into like the idea like he his outfit's started from his mom who, who was her prime time was around that time so her outfit was around that design so that's where I based the original design of the first outfit and then I was able to easily transition it to more masculine from there so that was my process <laughs> sorry that was like long-winded that's super interesting okay so what was it like seeing the book which was released on February 1st in final form <sighs> I'm not sure how I can explain it in words, but just like screaming internally happily. <laughs> it's just like, ah, oh, it's there, it's in my hands. Like, and just seeing how, like, it, it looks a lot bigger than how I imagine it. Um, I have self-published books that are, it's the same size, six by nine, and it's thinner. And so I'm like, yeah, it'll be around that page, but it's like, it's a lot thicker. And it, for some reason, it just looks bigger than my other books. I'm like, it just has this presence of like, it's here, it's there, I'm holding it, <laughs> like, oh my gosh, all my hard work, I could see it, and holding it is like, very validating. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, like, I did see, like, um, the review copy, uh, which was all black and white, so also seeing it in full color in the final version was, like, exciting as well, which is why I, like, always called it out, like, oh, it's so colorful, I'm like, yes, the webcomic is colorful, too, <laughs> but, like, seeing it in that version, like, yes, that's what it's supposed to look like. That's fantastic. Okay, so I have a bit of a technical question. Can you tell us a little bit about how the creative process changed later on in the series when you began working with a colorist and art assistant? Oh my gosh, I love my team. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm not sure how to start this, but like before having the team, right, I always thought like, oh, for it to be absolutely mine I have to do all everything I have to do the line art, I have to do the story like it's not authentic if it's not all me but of course like I know like even in professional mangaka like I did draw inspiration from they have a whole team working on their comic I'm like why am I torturing myself trying to do everything myself and like to get these comics out there especially web comics like you have these tight deadlines that you want to like push this comic out if I didn't have a team this would have taken me five years to complete, you know? So it's like, okay. So I slowly had to like start with um, my, my editor. Let's start with my editor, Brooke. She was like, are you sure you don't want 
a colorist or even a line artist to help you with. So I had to be slowly brought in bringing in these people. So I first with colorists because I was that was the first thing that I was able to let go and delegate because I'm like, okay, I can lay in the flats and they can shade. Okay, I'm, I'm okay with that. Oh, wait, you know what? They could do the flats. They know the color is. I have a color guide now. So that was the thing. I had to like make color guides and that was a, a new experience that I had to do. I'm like, oh yeah, it's like I, I, I do these really sloppy color guides for myself. Let me just make it fancier for someone else to work off. And then, so we build a rapport with um, the colors uh, dojo. Um, he helped out with that at first and then started, started taking more on the colors, shading. And then I would just go on top of it again and edit final touches, like effects that were kind of off. And then after a while, we did that for a few episodes. I was starting to really feel the burnout <laughs> and all of that. So we finally brought an art assistant, Sarah uh, Swati. Um, I hope I said her last name right. Uh, but yeah, she, uh, she did an incredible job copying my line art style to do the line art, which I had so much pride on. So that was really hard for me to let go too. <laughs> Even more so with coloring, because coloring is like, yeah, you just copy the colors and then put it on the comic, but like line art, I'm like, I have this certain style of the line art. It's crisp and clean. I'm so proud of it. I'm like, I'm letting this ego <laughs> pride in the way of accomplishing this comic so when I finally let go it was like very slow of like here do the line art and for every page I'll check over it and I'll give you edits for line art and then eventually I started to realize even with the mistakes and putting color on top of it you really don't see those minor mistakes so I even let go of like those minor things and let you know, Sarah take over and actually do a great job. Some people, some people say they notice the art change, and then some other people are like, no, I don't really see it, and then it's, it's totally fine, you know. And it's just amazing working with them because they just did a great job. I'm like, I wish I let go sooner, you know, because it's great working with team, and you're not alone in the process, which can feel very lonely when you're doing a comic by yourself. So like, it's it's been an amazing experience working with them. <laughs> Okay, so can you tell us a little bit about the outside anthology? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So after completing Magical Boy and how seeing it is being so successful, I thought I would like pay it forward to like other like real trans men and women and non-binary artists to share their personal story because like Magic Boy he's a fictional character you know like which people can easily write off of like oh yeah he's he could be you know be himself because he's a cartoon and so I'm just like no 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 let me collect a bunch of these artists who are real <laughs> and have their real experience and then yeah and share it because I love slice of life um autobiography type of comics where you get you know inside look of an artist's life daily life um which i have a series myself called mondo mango which i just talk about my life and so like i wanted a version where i find like experiences from trans people and non-binary individuals and see how what their experiences are like and i haven't really seen that quite anywhere i have seen trans anthologies which is great, <laughs> which like, it's like all, it's all, everyone's trans and then they're making their stories and it's either, you know, it's a mix of fiction and nonfiction. I wanted this to be purely nonfiction in the artist's perspective and their personal stories. And I thought that was very important. So <laughs> I pitched this to my friend who was really, um, my friend David, who was experienced doing uh, anthologies, comic anthologies and then really experienced with the Kickstarter. So I know there was like a better chance of this succeeding if I worked with him. And then he uh, is also helping me, me with distributing the books. So like that helped it. And I um, brought in my um, my friend Min, who is a Danish non-binary um, individual artist too. And I wanted their input to make sure everything was like good, <laughs> you know? And, and so then from there on, yeah, we like, together we like you know reached out to artists and there it became <laughs> the outside it's super exciting yes and then we just printed the book so like we're in the process of shipping out and everything so it's i can't wait to get my copies because it's only coming to uh, david right now awesome 
I can't wait to see it too. And I, I understand there'll be copies available from Stack Deck Press, I think I saw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tara is in it and she's going to have a few that, she, that she'll also sell on her shop. Yeah. So just in case you haven't mm -hmm. Like I'll it. have copies for my website too. So I'm like, I'm telling people, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> He's being a little rascal. <laughs> That's okay. Um, yeah, like uh, we in our home page on Kickstarter, we have a link of where like places you can shop for it after Kickstarter fulfillment is completed. So it'll be available. <laughs> and we'll, I'll let, I'll let everyone know. <laughs> I'm definitely looking forward to it. Okay, so speaking of Mondo Mango, in addition to working on Magical Boy as a webcomic, you have another webcomic. Um, how does creating a slice of life comic based on yourself compare with making a more genre-based story like Magical Boy? Okay, so yes, I always um, mention this when I'm telling people who are interested in creating comics, whereas like, oh, the easiest route for me, which I always think is like basing it off your real life. So like, yeah, Mondo Mango about my life because you take examples from real life and then put it into comic form like oh I went to get coffee and I was embarrassed because I ordered tea with creamer and that was weird <laughs> and then now I'm embarrassed to go back to that same place like I could make a comic about that it's easy uh whereas making magical boy it's all like fictional all in your head and then like you're more protective of it right and more scared of people thinking it's dumb because it didn't really happen and it's made up but so you're like but you're proud of it right so it's like it's more scarier and ah uh, but it's I feel like it's more what's what's the word like satisfied more fulfilling I feel like it's so much more fulfilling because it's like because of that fear and like building world building and everything they like put more work into it to like make it come alive and so that was like one of the biggest differences <laughs> is that I had to like overcome making this story because yeah I, I just base my stuff on real life but then there's that aspect in there, like we mentioned, like some of the characters are based from real life friends, taking their personalities or uh, their features and everything. Like you, you still kind of input it into your like fiction work. Um, but it's it's still, <laughs> I feel like it's a lot harder. <laughs> Okay, so for those who are experiencing Magical Boy for the first time as a graphic novel series, what can we just expect when the second volume arrives from Scholastic on September 6th? Uh, you'll get more lore <laughs> that's missing from the first half. We're going to dive in into that, um, get to know the deities, Aurora and Devoid, seeing like what happened, why, why did this whole thing happen? So you get a lot of answers from there, and it's going to become a lot more colorful because you know the colors of the rainbows are going to be splashing in that volume and you're going to get a lot of uh, your euphoric feelings like especially for max <laughs> for that happy ending so when you op open up the final copy of that one it's really going to be like yeah <laughs> like color in your face beam of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay so my last question is just is there anything else that you'd like to tell us today uh, I can't think of any. <laughs> Those all the questions before are really good. <laughs> thank you so much, and thank you yeah. so much for talking with us. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. I guess. <laughs> everyone, pick up Magical Boy Volume One and Volume Two is on the way. Yes, you can pre-order Volume Two right now. Actually, <laughs> it's coming out September sixth, as far as I know. Okay. <laughs> thank you.